We are recording. Jack, how are you today? I'm very good, Stu. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Jack, before we start talking tracks and stuff, mm -hmm. um, 2022 at the moment seems like a, a far more um, relaxed place than what 2021 was. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about lockdown for you. How did you find it personally and how did you find it creatively? Um, lockdown was, I mean, arduous to say the least, I think. Um, I think, uh, I mean, it was, it was very, very hard for everybody, but I think, um, I am someone who really enjoys being out and being proactive and, you know, that involves doing gigs and things like that. So being stuck inside, and I think it's also, it was the feeling of a, a loss of c control and, um, uh, you know, I suppose uh, the the only caveat to that was that everyone was in that same boat, so you didn't feel quite as alone. But um, it was really, really hard, and I think that it's only now that, uh, looking back, that I really realise uh, the detrimental effect that actually uh, had on my mental health as well for being stuck inside for such a long time and feeling like all the th plans I had and things I'd set up because I'd just started uh, going solo because I'd been in a band for a number of years beforehand and that was quite an intense experience and I just got the courage together to go uh, solo and I was really feeling um, enthused by that um, and in many ways I was quite lucky because the pandemic came along before I'd gone uh, much further with it you know to to really have something to lose because I know a lot of people who had just got their careers kind of going and um, and the uh, pandemic just completely took that out. So I was kind of lucky in a way that I hadn't got further than I did. But at the same time, it just completely, it was a feeling of the, you know, the rug being taken out from underneath you and never knowing when you could go back and what that world would look like when you went back. Do you, do you think that people, and, 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 and not just young people, but do you think people in general were now, a year later, or, or however long it's been since it's all kind of, you know, normal services resumed somewhat. But do you think we're only sort of starting to see now the effects that it's had on a lot of people's mental health? Well, certainly for me personally, I have. Um, and I think we will see the effects of it uh, not only through people, but through, I mean, we see it in the world now. I think uh, we're, we're seeing the sort of um, ripples of yeah. of uh, what happened there going out and we probably will do for the next you know decade or so maybe more um so um but for what you're saying about you know people's mental health i, I suppose that's very kind of you know person to person i suppose yeah. um yeah. but for me personally absolutely i'd agree with that yeah for sure yeah. let's talk records okay Jack, I'm going to ask you for track one, please, to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Okay, so the number one I picked is Street Fighting Man by oh, Rolling Stones. Great it's, choice, Yes, mate. it's such a cracking kick, kick off. And every time you hear it, it's just like, yes, you know, this is adventure has started. And um, I particularly remember um, loving it when I saw it in a, in a documentary. It was a um, uh, Michael Moore documentary yeah. and they play that uh in it and it's just and it's just in in the trailer and it's just it's just so great and um yeah it's not every time i hear that intro i'm just like yes it just pumps me up so much so i'm always interested when i because I, I like to ask artists this this question uh, in regards to intro and and i'm always fascinated when i speak to younger artists and uh and so when it comes to writing songs, mm -hmm. Jack, yes. and, and intros, just one of the way that I, I, I look at my, my teenage daughters and how, how quickly their fingers move on their devices and their attention spans are quite short. And we're seeing mm -hmm. lots of more, I guess, commercial pop acts, like um, they're being almost a science to, to write in pop music now where it's, you know, straight in with a chorus. And, mm. you know, and, and, and I just wonder when you know and, and the emphasis now i guess is less radio and more about things like TikTok and spotify and they're not necessarily any of these mediums that i necessarily subscribe to sure but i am aware you know through 450 of these episodes that 
certain artists, it factors into their into their approach. And I just wonder when you sit down and, and you write a song, how much of any of that, if at all, factors into your creative process? What, uh, whether or not it will be received on TikTok and Instagram and things like that. That sort of things thing. Like, and, and obviously with like the intro, it's like, you know, if I'm going to get on a Spotify playlist, do I have to hook them instantly? You know, um, well, I think the you know the science that you're talking about of you know that sort of pop mentality uh, that's always been around. Mm. You know, since pop music kind of began in the fifties. Uh, you know, uh, that sort of post-war kind of um, revival of music. Um, so that's that's never uh, gone away. That's always been there. You know, also. Uh, also, sometimes it works out very well, like with uh, Motown, you know, their Perfect. whole thing was like, you know, it is literally a factory and we're going to be just churning out these songs. And they did it really, really well. And they made some incredible songs like that. Um, that, so, said, uh, that said, yes, yeah, it did get to the point with Motown when you start looking at tracks as they developed as a as the artists developed things like Papa was a Rolling Stone and not mm. and not get ready or are not ain't too proud to beg they're like these more well with the political out. side of it comes and, in. and, and obviously yeah. famously the, the biggest selling Motown album of all time what's going on yeah was very good he was like it's oh, very this, true what, and ball of confusion this? yeah ball, ball of confusion of, yeah, great example exactly. yeah right? yeah you know so I do yeah. think that so you know, yeah I, I totally agree with you on that and I think um the caveat to that is that it's like it, it kind of all it depends what you want to do you know and it all kind of works, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's good to just write a song that's just a positive tune, you know, yeah. that you're, that you're not taking too seriously, you know, because I think there's nothing worse than, you know, taking yourself too seriously in, the, in that regard. And, uh, you know, yeah, both, both ways work. And I think it entirely depends on what you're, the message that you're trying to put forward. Are you trying to write a song that's very sincere and from the heart? I mean, they should all be from the heart, but is it like, is it really sincere and serious? Is it, is it dark or is it, um, you know, are you trying to do a juxtaposition maybe on something or yeah, it's t- it entirely depends on uh, what you're doing, but um, I definitely don't consider like, Oh, w- will this do well on TikTok? And yeah. I don't, and I don't do that in a, in a way that's like, you know, I do it on principle. It's sure. more of a case of that. That's just, I, that's not what I'm doing. You know, and I and I don't really hold anything against anyone who is doing that necessarily, but that's not what I want to do. Uh, my uh, songs, when I'm writing them, they all, you know, coming from a place of sincerity, and that's what I want to do because it's kind of a way of uh, trying to connect with people. You know, Absolutely. kind of you kind of bear your, a bit of your soul in a way, and then people can see a bit of themselves in it or a bit of their experience, or it completely encapsulates an emotional experience that they're having or have had. And um, and that's what's really important to me, is that is that connection of someone to come up to me and say, that's my favourite song, because you absolutely nailed what I've been feeling or something that I've been thinking about. Good answer there, Jack. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on me, please, man. Uh, so the first song that I ever heard that had emotional impact on me was actually uh, Mad World by Gary Jules. Okay. So the Gary Jules version, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I remember that being on the um, film Donnie Darko I watched as a teenager. I mean, I take it since then you've then heard the, the Tears for Fears version. As yes, well. yes. Uh, do you prefer Gary Jewell? Well, I think I, I'm kind of biased towards it because that's the first, that's the one that has my emotional connection to it. Do you know what I mean? It's, I, don't, I don't think one's necessarily better than the other, but it's, that's the thing. It's like when people say, oh, you know, everything's been written already. Um, but the reality is that it doesn't really matter because, you know, the next generation that comes along, you know, if they hear a song, you know, by, you know, George Ezra or something and George Ezra writes a song that maybe a member of the older generation are like, well, that sounds exactly like something I was listening to. Yeah. It doesn't matter because the the younger person has the emotional connection to that new song. Yeah. And that's what matters. It doesn't really matter that there's another song that sounds like it or something. So in terms of this one, it, I'm you're definitely going to prefer the Gary Jules version because that's the one that I had the emotional uh, reaction to. And if you had to pinpoint... The emotion. What was it? Mm. Kind of an intense kind of sense of melancholy, I suppose. I think it kind of encapsulated my 
sort of feelings as a teenager of, you know, I think all teenagers struggle in, you know, different ways because being a teenager is it's really quite a hard thing to do because, you, you know, you're kind of, you're suddenly starting to ha have these new kind of adult um, sort of perspectives, but you're still a kid, really. So you're kind of in this kind of place where you've got one foot in each camp, you know, and, um, and you know, all these new emotions and you don't have any idea how to deal with them yet. Um, and I think that song kind of encapsulated that, that feeling, that in, that intensity of being a teenager, that sort of feeling of being sort of a bit lost and trying to figure out who you are and what you're going to do. And where was home growing up? And that was Dorset. Okay. Happy times? Yeah, it was a lovely place to grow up. Lovely place to grow up. And I, I have a feeling that although I moved away to live, uh, you know, in the bright lights of Brighton, um, I feel like I'll probably end up back there one day because yeah. it, is, it is a wonderful place. But when you're 18 uh, and you want to do music, there's not a lot there for you. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me about growing up and, and music. How much music was around you at home? Uh, there was, uh, yeah, a lot of music around me because uh, my parents have both been involved in the music industry uh, in different ways. Uh, so, yeah, there was all, and uh, even other members of my family have had their own different sort of connections to the music industry. So it was um, pretty constant, really. I mean, I mean, aside from the obvious, like, was was there like always sort of like was the radio on at home growing up and was you know was there a stereo that was always on and was there instruments laying around that yeah there were in there were instruments laying around and uh music being played pretty regularly yeah um we didn't really had the radio on as much it'd always be like bbc4 or something it was more yeah. of a background thing but there was always musical stuff around and but like what uh really got me into it was cuz um I'd had like uh, guitar lessons when I was very, very young, when I was in primary school, and I wasn't really interested. And and you know they made me play like recorder at school and it's hated that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I actually hated it so much that I <laughs> took my recorder and there was a river near our school and I threw it in the river because <laughs> I didn't want to do recorder. And um, that's so fucking punk rock. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's launching your recorder. Into that's a right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's. I think that's as punk rock as you can possibly get involving a recorder. But 100%. um, yeah, that's it. That's as far as it goes. But um, uh, yes. So yeah. So I, 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 you know, I wasn't interested in that. And uh, also, I, I had piano briefly as well. But that was it. Was very stuffy. It was a kind of it was, this wasn't particularly inspiring, and what actually got me round to it was uh, a computer game, which I think is kind of quite unique to my generation. Is that it was the computer game um, Guitar Heroes, and uh, I think it was Guitar Heroes Legends of Rock. It was that specific one. I remember playing it because a lot of people at school were playing it as well, and I became obsessed with this game and obsessed with the songs on it. And I found other kids my age at school who also loved the game, but could also play guitar. Yeah. And that's when it became an identity thing. Instead of it being something that was I was kind of being taught that I wasn't really interested in, it became this identity thing of like I was part of this gang almost of other kids at school who loved music, were obsessed with music and could play guitar. And that sort of made me think, well, I've got to learn guitar now. You know, it really inspired me to do it. And uh, I also went to my parents and told them about, you know, the songs on the game and said, oh, do you know these songs? And of course they did. And they then would show me the whole discography of each band and kind of gave me a little kind of talk through like the kind of uh, history of like, you know, the, the development of uh, rock and roll and guitar music and, and sort of all, you know, all the sort of genres and where they came through. And um yeah, and that's kind of that's when suddenly the inspiration really got me is when it became, like I said, this this uh, thing of identity, yeah. and uh, trying to be a part of this uh, gang at school. Okay, I'm going to stay in the, the, the formative years for this one. Tell me the the song that reminds you of your time at school, please, Jack. Okay, so this is a slightly obscure one actually, but um, it's uh, "Shake Some Action" by the Flaming Groovies. I don't know this. Tell me about it. Do you not? Know? Okay, know. so the Flaming Groovies were kind of a band that were around. Uh, the same sort of time as the Ramones. Right. 
And I think they played sort of the similar places. And I, I don't know if they, they, partic- they got particularly far, but they had a sort of brief uh, amount of time. And um, and they have this one song in it that's just, just fantastic and um, very riffy, very sort of uh, very guitar-y. And uh, I didn't enjoy school particularly when I was younger. What um, was that? Uh, because uh, I think I well, I felt like I didn't particularly fit in very well, and I was uh, I was quite shy and sort of sensitive. Um, so. I uh, felt, yeah, I felt a bit sort of uh, defensive at school. And uh, yeah, I couldn't find many people who were into the same sort of stuff as me. So I sort of felt a bit isolated and um, and didn't take that very well. Um, but on the way to school, on the occasions that my mom did uh, drive me when I couldn't get the bus, she would put on this song because she really loved it too. We'd listen to it together and it would like cheer me up before school and kind of get me ready to go in. So I just have very fond memories of my mum playing it for me to kind of like cheer me up. Yeah, that's lovely. Did you did you know what you wanted to be when you was at school? <laughs> uh, well, I actually wanted to be an actor slash film director okay. when I was at school. So I went to film school briefly and I loved that. And I still love uh, that side of things. But um, I think I always knew I wanted to uh, to perform and write because I loved writing stories and I loved performing so I knew something in that ilk but uh, I didn't know it was going to be music until I got really into playing guitar and I learned guitar and then started a little band but uh, it kind of yeah originally it was it was film and I went to film school briefly Tell me about where the confidence come from because you mentioned that you know you felt like you, you... You know, you didn't. You wasn't at school with people with shared interests, and you know, uh, and obviously at that point you hadn't found your tribe, and mm. and and so tell me where from from being you know a, a shy a shy kid to then thinking right I'm gonna I'm gonna either be an actor <laughs> or I'm yeah. gonna walk on a stage with a band and front a band because both of them things mm. take confidence that most people would sure. never have uh, or, or or could even comprehend you know having the, 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 the stones to get out and do that. So sure, sure, where, sure. where that come from? Well, um, here's the thing, because that's the thing about, you know, they say about courage is that it's not having no fear. It's doing it despite fear. So um, I still get very nervous, you know. I, I still can be a very nervous person for sure. So it's, it's not a case of it being gone, you know. Um, so, if, you know, because I think there's a lot of people out there who feel, I think it's quite common basically is what I'm saying, for um artists particularly to be like that and I think some people when they feel like that they feel like oh I can't do that because they'll they'll see me on stage or something they'll be like well you know look at that guy like he just he's just on top of the world look how much confidence he's got but in the reality um you know there's a lot of insecurities in there and a lot of uh nervous energy as well that I have to deal with so it's not a case of just like yep it's you know total you know uh totally easy but um I think where uh, that came from, though, was that being in a in a in an environment where I felt very shut down, but really wanted to be, you know, to perform and uh, make people feel entertained and keep. Maybe it's even a way of like wanting to keep their attention, really, and and yeah, and kind of yeah, make them feel entertained and moved and um, and things like that. And I think it probably came from a place of me being like going from that and then being like, okay, I'll show you, I'll show you, yeah. You think I'm going to be like this, like, you know, this sort of like downtrodden person. But like, okay, yeah, I'll show you. I should, I'll show all of you, you know, <laughs> it gets a bit sort of mad scientist-y. But um, I think that's where it came from is a feeling of like, okay, I'm going to show everyone and I'm going to get out there and I'm going to do it. Okay. Tell me the first song you remember buying from a record shop. Okay. It's another obscure one, actually. Um, This was um a LP that was... uh. I'm free by the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the more obscure kind of Rolling Stones tune. Covered by the Soup Dragons, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, I bought it on a family trip to America. And I was in, it was a town just outside of um, Asheville, West Virginia. Pretty sure it was West Virginia. And uh, it was this. It was like a little town that had this like kind of like train sort of 
depot that had all the you know the kind of like train cars that you would jump mm -hmm. into you know to kind of um you know get a free trip and stuff like that like it was something out of like some sort of movie yeah. and there was a little record shop there and it was just the coolest thing and i was going yeah going through them all and you could take them out you could put them in a booth you could listen to them Man. and i listened to this one and because i was already a fan of the running stones and this kind of older music and it was um uh it was that one and was it fast train what's that buy me a ticket for an airplane yeah ain't got time to take fat yeah i can't remember but that it was that as well i remember buying that one as well but um uh, yeah, I listened to them in the booth. And I loved them. I bought them then and brought them home. So I, I'm intrigued uh, again with to, to, to speak to sort of younger musicians to, because yeah, I've, it blew my mind that you used the word LP. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> don't have any young people using that word, so that was, that sure. was nice to hear. Yeah, um, but tell me what your relationship is with, with, with a record shop now because I, 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 where I live, I actually went into the big super sort of. Uh, shopping centre near where I live and there's a huge HMV in there which I hadn't been in for, for years and I walked in and I was it was like literally 60% vinyl and I was like wow mm. and, and and it was lovely to see I mean don't yeah. get me wrong it was about 30 quid an album and I was like that's yep. ridiculous like but, yeah um like what's your relationship with you know with, with, with the record shop now and vinyl and and, mm -hmm. and being a you know a young artist that's releasing music well, that's the thing, I think, is that it's now become a kind of, like, niche add-on. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like... Because CDs are gone, more or less, Yeah. you know? And uh, cassettes kind of made a bit of a comeback, but then we see not as much as vinyl. And it's kind of like... That's for, like, the real... Music, you know, not say real music fans. That's not what I mean. But I mean, as in, like, the real... The really intense music fans have yeah. this kind of other kind of niche side to it. Um... And I suppose my relationship with the uh, records is that I, I do I love both because I love having my music available whenever I need it. You know I like that, and I like to be able to make my own playlists and stuff like that. So I I, I really like that kind of convenience that comes mm -hmm. with streaming. However, it is very disappointing when you have a really great piece of album artwork, and it kind of gets squashed down on Spotify or anything like that. Whereas if you know having a record, it's like when you have the artwork there, it's kind of like a whole other side of, to the experience. You know, it's, uh, you, you can really appreciate the artwork. It's something about physically holding it in your hand and having it, you know, it really feels like it's yours in that sort of way. Um, do so I, do you think that's because like so much stuff is on a device now and, and it, mm. it, there's something to, to be enjoyed about I, I the, J j just the action of putting a, a record on and then being sure. able to sit there and have that sleeve, something tangible in your mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as an old man, you know, I would <laughs> put, the, put a record on and then devour the sleeve. The sleeve yes, has exactly. everything within yep, it. And, yep, yep. and I love that. And I do think, and I'm so glad you said that, Jack, because I don't want to come across like, you know, an old granddad and like, oh, back in the days of vinyl, because I'm not. I love Spotify and I love lots of the different sort of streaming services. I love making playlists like yourself. Sure. But, I do think that the big loss is that when you see so many, you know, iconic record sleeves from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you don't really get that anymore. Like, they're there, mm. but because you don't get that wow factor of seeing them on a great big record or a CD, like, yeah, it's just on, on Spotify, on your phone, you're not really... The, the work and love that goes into these, you know. Well, I feel like that's where they, you know, they both get covered, I suppose, in a way. That's, I think that's why vinyl has mm. kind of come out uh, alongside the digital side of things. Because sure. um, you're right, the vinyl is kind of covering a side to it that the dig digital can't do. Mm. So it's like if you want that kind of more intimate experience with it, then that's where the vinyl comes in. Sure. And uh, But the, you know, the uh, digital side makes it so that it's more accessible. Yeah. You know, because you know, I love playing music in my car. I love that, and you can't play a record in your car, so yeah. like it is, is is not nearly as kind of, uh, um, sort of yeah, accessible in in that way. So, I yeah, I mean, I I think I just love both, but for different reasons, I yeah. suppose. And I'm kind of glad that they're both around, and they both they both have their own problems as well. Absolutely. So it's kind of yeah, it's yeah.
Okay, well, I don't know why I'm going to say, tell me the song that soundtracked your years in club land. You're a young man. You should, be, <laughs> you should be enjoying clubbing. Tell me the song that soundtracked your years to date in club Okay, land. Okay. okay. So what I picked was uh, Forget by Patrick Topping. Okay. Yeah, who's a DJ who uh, I used to be quite obsessed with uh, when I was in my clubbing years because... Um, you know, I'm 28 now, and I can still go clubbing, but it's not the not the same. It's not really the same. You know, back it was different when I was younger because it was uh, I don't know. I think it was all because everything was so intense back then. You know, because I was in a band as well, so it kind of like it it fit that um environment. And you know, I used to love staying up until the sun came up. Whereas now it makes you want to cry if I've stayed up that <laughs> if I've stayed up that late if the sun's come up and I can hear the birds I'm like oh no oh god so um but yeah it's uh forget by uh Patrick Topping uh Patrick Topping which is um yeah I just every time I hear it I can feel myself back in that place you know how you know how someone's gonna just immediately transport yeah. you back to a certain point in time where was that place where was clubbing uh that was in Brighton I lived on a street called St. George's Road uh, in a really, really uh, sort of drab student flat. Um, and we had someone else staying there who wasn't supposed to be there because we basically had like half the band living there and a bunch of other friends. And it was an absolute tip. And uh, we had a lot of pies we weren't supposed to have there. And we just invite Sometimes we just leave the door open and just let people wander in. And I'm amazed that I never had anything stolen from my room because mine was the first one uh, on your way in. And uh, yeah, we'd go to uh, Concord 2, which is just down the road uh, to go clubbing. And we'd go to like the Arch and um, uh, uh, Coalition. Do we go to Coalition? No, but um, yeah, we just sort of, yeah, go out so and was- uh, Brighton all the time. Was the horn open then, or was that before the horn? Was the what, sorry? The, the horn. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the horn. Yeah. And could be That's changed before... now. I can't remember to what name, but it's yeah. it's changed now, yeah. Because the, the promoter there, he used to be a... Um, I used to... I'm a, I'm a club promoter as well, so I used to put nights on at the horn. Mm. But before that, that venue, I don't know if it was maybe before your time clubbing, it was called New Hero off Dyke Street. And, Never heard uh, new hero, no. Yeah, that was that was a cool little underground club. That, yeah, uh, that that's what got moved to to the haunt. And uh, yeah, there's that. I think I mean I was putting on nights down there probably sort of around ten years ago. And oh and, yeah, and it was an exciting place to be putting putting club nights on in Brighton. in Brighton. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, like that that little strip at the front. Um, where all the clubs are, you know, and you have all the, like the hotels there and stuff. And do you do you remember Buddies? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for whoever's listening who doesn't know, Buddies was a uh, a twenty four hour restaurant where you could get like a you know a dodgy carbonara at like five in the morning. And the amount of, like along that strip, the amount of times I can remember just walking along there at like yeah four in the morning like because obviously in the summer the sun comes up so early so you just be walking about at 4 a.m and then go and eat something at buddies and then see some other people that you were like out clubbing with and stuff and uh yeah and uh that was yeah that was kind of quite an intense time uh my life i think at, at that point so I, I was at the height of the band as well and uh everything was all very shooting from the hip i think yeah. but i suppose you're kind of supposed to do that at that age aren't you 100 percent, 100 percent. you spoke about confidence earlier jack and and you've chose an industry uh, to to be involved with that's famously very competitive and tough mm-hmm. tell me about your relationship with drive with drive or drive to do things to carry on um how driven are you with, with music well you know what i actually recently had a bit of a sort of change of perspective in okay. things like that because i've talked about mental health quite a lot um i'm very open about that uh on posts and in, in my music and uh particularly with uh, my newest single that's coming out soon on the um 8th of november which uh it's the first time I've really delved into um, that sort of side of things um, in a very sort of uh, kind of naked way, I suppose. And um, 
So basically, uh, I think for the, I've been doing this for a fair amount of years, and I think basically I was putting all of my self worth into music, like all my self worth as a human being into my success uh, with music. And I think sometimes the music industry kind of encourages that level of commitment, you know, that it does consume your life. And it's almost like a competition to see who's more consumed by it than, you know, than me. And um, uh, But the problem with that is that if I ever had a problem or I didn't get exactly what I wanted or had a little bit of like a not as much success as I wanted with something or made a mistake somewhere, it would just get it would kind of destroy me. You know, because I put everything into music. Like my, like I said, my entire self worth as a human being, uh, to being someone, uh, you know, to being on this earth, was that, and so it kind of stopped me from even enjoying it. Sure. You know, because it was just all about everything has to be perfect all the time. This is my life. Like even if I had free time, I would say no to doing anything else because I wanted the days free to uh jump on any opportunity that might potentially appear you know but that that's, you can't maintain that can you no no you can't trust me uh no you cannot and i and i didn't want to i got to a point where i was just like it's this is this isn't worth it it just isn't worth it and um i allowed myself to sort of enjoy other things in life as well and be okay with that and yeah it's it's kind of because also that's kind of it comes from a place of fear you know yeah. it doesn't you know it should come from a place of enjoying music and a love of music that's the important thing it should come from a place of love you felt like you couldn't take your foot off the gas no not at all not for a second and um i was terrified of doing that mm. and uh so you know I, you know the amount of times i've had people tell me to you know just chill out or just try and relax you know and it was just to me i felt like that just wasn't an option because i felt like if i did um it would all unravel, you know, or I'd miss an opportunity, you know, it's that, it's, it's that whole kind of attitude of like, that could have been the opportunity that, you know, gave you everything you ever hoped and dreamed for, yeah. and which obviously doesn't work like that at all. And um, it actually just makes everything harder. And I think the way you maintain it is because you think to yourself, I'll be happy in the future. That's when I'll be happy. When I get this kind of arbitrary fantasy of what my future is going to be like, that's when I'll be happy. And but also the problem with that is that if you feel if anything ever deviates away from that goal in your head, you panic and you're like, no, no, no. And you have to kind of you try to like shoehorn things into going that direction, which actually ironically makes you miss any other opportunities uh, you might have had uh, because, you know, life might take you in a different direction. and You realize, oh, actually, I prefer this or yeah. um, even if you do get what you wanted, it will almost definitely be in a way that you never really saw coming. And you'll probably enjoy it in a way that you didn't really expect to, you know. So it's kind of like you kind of got to let, kind of give yourself up to it in a in a way that isn't uh, trying to just cling on to it so tightly, you know. Yeah. It's about kind of like going with the flow of the river, then trying to direct the river in a way that you think it should be going. I'm going to take you home for track six, Jack. And I'm okay. Going to get to tell me favorite song from an artist from your home county please okay so home county in brighton is um is east Sus i always get confused whether it's east sussex or west sussex because it's like right on the border but i'm pretty sure it's east sussex but anyway from brighton it's um a song for it's quite a new one from quite a new artist that i've recently discovered it's um called in the end by a lad called jamie cook who's a uh, sort of up and coming singer songwriter in uh in Brighton and I heard his song um play before I did an interview on a local radio station and I thought it was brilliant and uh I've been uh like stalking him and harassing him ever since to uh because I want to meet him and say hello and I want to see him play <laughs> what sort of stuff is it uh I think this is the only song he's actually released recently but it's kind of I suppose how does it go? But it's very, it's very kind of singer songwritery kind of. Um, I would say it was like a, it'd be like a combination between like Jamie T and George Ezra. I'd say something okay. like that. So it's kind of like it's kind of quite um, humble and kind of um, sort of lo-fi, but uh, but it has uh, sort of 
a really good beat to it and it's quite kind of like has a really good hook to it as well. Yeah. How do you feel that your home county has affected you as a person and your creativity? Has it affected me as a person? That's a fantastic question, actually. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's the first time I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> when you say affected me as a person, as in why has it, how has it changed my creativity or and ch changed you as a person as well, and the, you know how has it impacted on your creativity? Because Brighton's a very creative place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, you mm -hmm. know, and and the, one of the reasons I set this this podcast up initially was um, I was always interested in. I, I live in Essex, and uh, and and the fellow that I do most of my work with is is a a, 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 a a former musician and an actor and a podcast called Scribius Pit. And, <laughs> yeah. And, I know. And oh, okay. So, so yeah. uh, and and I was chatting to Pip one day, and <clears throat> and he just ran the corner to me, and I mean, was just talking about because so many other bands from Essex, I know, like horrors and things like that, they they instantly relocate to London. Mm. And I said to Pip, I said, like, how comes like because he often gets, you know, oh, do you live in London? And he's like, no, no, no I live in Stamford Leo. It's kind of expected, isn't it? And like, yeah, and yeah, and I just wonder because Essex isn't. You know, it's it's got an incredible body of work has come from it, but mm. you wouldn't walk around the streets of Essex and think this is very creative, this is inspiring. Sure. Uh, and and it was only the fact that Pip was like, well, no. So the podcast was initially set up, Jack, to to ask people, hence it being called Off the Beat and Track, as to as to it was initially going to be based around location, and it sure. ended up sort of finding a, a, a sort of path of its own. Um, but I'm always intrigued as to the, the place where you live, how that affects you as a person, and 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 you know, and do people make assumptions about you from where you're from. Uh well, I do think Brian has a certain kind of reputation to be. It's kind of like the, I, know, I suppose it's like the sort of Amsterdam, isn't yeah. it, of England, I suppose. And um, so that's a great, that's a great it set. is, yeah, that is kind of that's what it's doing, isn't it? Yeah, and. Um, I think when I first arrived, it was quite a big, uh, almost culture shock because obviously I'd come from like you know a sleepy little village in Dorset to this. So it was very really kind of like country mouse, big city kind of mentality. Um, but um, it it was I think it was very intense at first, very intense experience because Brighton is just kind of it's just always on. There's always something going on. It's always quite loud, and it's not that big of a place, but it's just a lot of intensity kind of like squished yeah. into this one little pocket. And um, so I think it probably made me more intense as a person and with my creativity more kind of like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. Oh yeah, let's do that as well. Let's just do all of it. Ah, you know, and I think I've kind of grown out of that now a bit more and I've kind of come out the other side a bit, a bit more kind of, you know, thoughtful uh, with it all. But um, uh, I think at first it was definitely probably dialed the intensity up quite, quite far, I think. Last track, and this yes. is when you, uh, you can be a, a, a tastemaker or uh, a, an influencer, I believe they're called nowadays. Um, okay. Tell me a song, please, Jack, that you think many people may not know that you would like them to go and listen to. Okay, well, here's the thing, because I kind of wanted to put J.B. Cook onto this one as well. Okay. But I do, I do have... Is that allowed? You you can you can double him up. But I want another one from you as well. Then. Okay, I could do. It. Okay, well, let's just say I'm I'm saying the same for "In the End" by Jamie Cook. Okay. Because he's out there at that moment, and I feel like I should give him a little plug. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other one is a much more obscure one, I think. I mean, I'm worried I'm going to say it. And you're going to be like, I know that song or something. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's just going to be like I I've only just heard it and like. Actually, everyone else has already heard it. But... I'm still kicking myself. I don't know the Flaming Groovies, mate. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> true, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Well, then it'll be fine then. We'll be even. But um, it's uh, a, I think it's a, a Greek band called Aphrodite's Child. And the song is called The Four Horsemen. Yeah, so that, that is fronted by, um, I believe, uh, a musician called Demis Roussos. Right. Uh, that's a tune, mate. Do so you do know it? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> right. There you go. There you go. But yes, isn't it? It's kind of like it's, it's like a sort of almost Led Zeppelin kind of esque yeah. kind of like 
trippy kind of song and it's yes yeah, it's fantastic I, and i heard it because someone was playing it on uh the radio comment some sort of uh, radio show on it and i was just driving along and it came on i thought that is a fantastic song yeah. and i've and it's, it's one of those things you know when you just hear the song that you really love and you listen to it obsessively yeah that's currently where i'm at with this one at the moment so it's incredible. Everything's cranked to 11 and it's just <laughs> bananas as well. Yeah, it's absolutely. Absolutely. It's like a good trip encapsulated yeah. into a song, basically. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Oh, great share. Um, well, look, we make it really easy for people to go and um, explore uh, and, and find out about Jamie Cook as well because we put together a little playlist of the songs uh, on Spotify. Oh, perfect. Okay. Company this pod. Yeah. So people can go and check them all out. Um, Jack, we're we're fast uh, approaching Christmas and the end of twenty twenty two. What you got planned for the rest of this year, mate? Well, um, I'm going to be doing some uh, gigs soon. I'm going to be uh, playing on uh, the twentieth, twenty first, and twenty second of November. So I'm in uh, Sheffield on the twentieth of November. I'm in Hull on the 21st of November, and I'm in Manchester on the 22nd of uh, November. And I've also got a new track coming out, uh, which is uh, Form Over Function, which is the third and final installment of uh, this uh, trilogy of songs I've put together, because um, the videos for the uh, songs will become part of uh, this sort of like one story. Yeah. And uh, and it, this is kind of like, yeah, the final kind of amalgamation of it. And um, that will be coming out on the 8th of November. Wonderful. Um, Jack, if people want to, um, if they're not following you already and they want to keep up to speed with all of this, where's the best place to, to find out about what's going on? Uh, well, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Yeah, <laughs> they convinced <laughs> me to do TikTok, so I am on there as well. Um and all of them are at Jack Valero Music. So you just wow. type in at Jack Valero Music. Is, um, I'm pretty sure all of them are the same handle. And uh, you'll find me there and just look for uh, a skinny little guy in a big space suit. And that's me. Lovely. Jack, it's been a real pleasure talking record. Thank you. Mate. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Stu. Really enjoyed it. Lovely stuff. I'm going to press stop. Don't go anywhere. All right. <laughs>